has turned everything off. There we go. So we're recording. We are, we're recording this session uh, so that it can go up on Tushy Cymru's Knowledge Hub and Social Farms and Gardens website. And if you uh, are uncomfortable with that, please do turn off your camera and your change your name if you'd like to on your screen as well. Um, great. So if, you, if you'd like to start introducing yourselves in the chat, just while I do um, a, a wee bit more, then please do that. Your name, I'm Scylla Black, your name, uh, which organisation you're from, and your reason for being here today, what you're hoping to get out of today would be great. Um, <clears throat> Gary's going to talk a little bit about social farms and gardens, so I'll, I'll let him do that when he, when he comes into his session. And Gary's the, the Joint Wales Manager for Social Farms and Gardens. Um, we're delighted to be uh, partnered with Tuffy Cymru for all the work that we're doing uh, with the Welsh CSA cluster. Um, Tuffy Cymru is run by Lantra and they work with the commercial horticulture sector, sector in Wales. Um, all the Tuffy Cymru project resources are open access via their website uh, for edibles and ornamentals, lots of workshops um, and, uh, and webinars and sessions online for various different networks. So pumpkin and squash, soft fruit, vegetables, seed, future farmer, um, and there's lots of really incredibly useful tailored training um, on their knowledge hub. And I will, will post a, a, a link in the chat when I finished speaking. Um, there's also the UK CSA network, uh, which again, you can join as a member that is paid, um, at, but there's lots of national support available through the UK CSA network. And again, I'll, I'll post a link in, in the chat before we finish today. Um, I'm going to hand over to Gary, and uh, Gary can get started on the the the, the meat of the session, and I'll, I'll see you a bit later. Thanks, everyone. Morning, Gary. all. Uh, thanks, Anne Marie. Uh, great to see a few new faces and a few new names, and always good to see some old friends as well. So, thanks for joining us on an early Thursday morning for what could possibly be termed as not the most exciting um, session that you might want to listen into. Um, I'm going to try and run this as interactively as I can. i very happy to be interrupted, take questions. If you've got a question, shout out, unmute yourself, drop it in the chat. Uh, Maggie will look through the chat and, and take some questions from there as well, because I can't actually see them while I was presenting. Um, I like to talk, so please do butt in, uh, slow me down, ask if you're not sure of anything. We will share the presentation with you afterwards as well, so you'll have the sort of the meat of it, um, but I want to try and delve in a little bit more about some of the governance options that we might have. And obviously this is a focus session towards CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, but it's applicable, to be honest, across most of the sort of groups we would support in social farms and gardens, and, and indeed some of the ones that Tuvi Cymru would support under the more commercial horticulture systems. Okay, so just a quick overview of social farms and gardens really and, and what we're up to in Wales and this slide really shows the impact that we've got in Wales. Over 500 allotment sites, 239 community gardens, 73 community orchards, 34 community supported agriculture sites, 33 keep wells, food growing gardens, 28 incredible edible projects and I see one of you here from incredible edible Porth Maddock, <laughs> nice to see you, uh, controlled environment sites, only got two city farms in Wales, but we don't have many cities either, so that's that's okay with me. And when we were doing the mapping, we were asked by Welsh Government, could we map the activity around school growing and school gardens and stuff? And actually we had to say no, because there's just such a vast array out there. Almost every primary school in Wales has access to some form of small garden plot, composting, apple trees, things like that. Um, so we sort of said, look, there's loads of activity out there. Be lovely to map it but it's let's just take it that it's a good thing to do in schools so quite a vast array of different settings on the ground uh, and what i want to give you an idea is what some of the governance methods some of those sites might choose to use and the reasons why uh, it might be worth whilst whilst i'm chatting if you if you're part of a group just drop in the chat what type of governance you think you have and we'll Come back to some of them at the end as well and really first to point out that there are two main difference between legal forms and organizational types so a type is really a name that's attached to an entity 
something like a CSA, community supported agriculture. There isn't a legal definition of what a community supported agriculture site is. There's, there's good definitions around what it's trying to do and things like that, but it's not a legal form. A cooperative, again, it's a nice word, people working in cooperative natures, but actually a cooperative itself is not a legal form. Community, social enterprise, third sector group, people might use that those terms as well. Um, those that are perhaps managing and owning land or properties might call themselves a development trust. You could be a community finance institution, you could be a partnership, you could be a charity. And a charity, again, isn't really a legal form, it's, it's a type of entity. So it sort of defines what you might want to be trying to do. And the actual legal forms then, looking at the other side, a company is a legal form, you could be self-employed as a sole trader and that is a legal entity. You could be a CIO, a charitable incorporated organization. You could be a society, so a type of co-op or an IPS, which is an industrial provident society. You could be a community interest company with shares or not. You could be an association, a trust or a partnership. And all of those have a legal definition. If you call yourself a CIO, you are bound by the rules of the charity, charitable incorporated organization um, and have certain hoops to go through. And we'll run through some of those. There are advantages and disadvantages with many of those, but before you get down the route of deciding whether you want to be a legal form or not, you have to actually decide whether you want to be bothered to be incorporated or unincorporated. And this is the trick that some people miss. You can be an unincorporated group and still do loads of activity and not be bound by some of those legal forms. But if you want to protect yourself perhaps around liability, you have to be incorporated. So I'll, I'll talk through some of these, possibly won't talk through much on the other slide that shows this in more detail. But if you're an unincorporated group, so somebody comes together in your village, your community says, I wanna do some great stuff around food and you get together and you sit in the pub, you have a pint or a cup of coffee and you say, yeah, great, let's, let's chat about what we wanna do. That sort of group would be unincorporated. You could create yourselves a constitution and you could define roles within that group, but you're still unincorporated in terms of the law, HMRC, Companies House, Charitable Commission, et cetera, et cetera. And actually that's, that's often fine. You could do loads as an unincorporated group and you could actually choose not even to have a con constitution if you wanted. You just get on and do what you want to do because you're like-minded people and you want to do good but the risks associated with that if you tried to own property be that land a tractor a farm a barn the risk sits with the individuals within that group so you cannot limit the liability to the individuals but uh, from the individuals it's actually not possible to enter in, enter into ownership in that group's name so if you were group Kenevin and you wanted to take on land and you were unincorporated, you couldn't. It would be taken on in the names of the individuals within that group in terms of the law. Uh, and therefore, there's a risk attached to that. If things go wrong, people are personally liable for whatever failures they might be. Um, but there's some advantages. Costs absolutely nothing to get around the table in the pub and set yourselves up as a group. Um, administration, you do as much as you want to. And privacy, not, I'm not advocating for that, but actually you don't need to tell anyone what you're doing outside of your group if you don't want to. Obviously it's good practice to get as many people involved as you can. Whereas if you look at the incorporated line there, yep, you can limit the liability of the individuals within the, the form of legal entity that you set up. That body can own land, can own property, can own money, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the risk is more divided. So all the members are treated the same. You still can't do anything dodgy. And if you do anything that's against the law as an individual, you're still liable as an individual. That sort of goes across all of this. But you, if the company does something wrong or the group does something wrong and you're incorporated, the risk is put on that organisation and effectively the organisation is liquidated or whatever, and it, the risk doesn't filter down to the individuals. Small cost to setting up, depending on which group you choose or which route you choose. Um, and there's a bit more administration. So you have to file some things in some places, depending on which form of governance you take. Um, and 
in some forms certain details of those members and its let's say its rules its articles what it wants to do are in the public domain uh, and that's so other people can see what you're up to i don't know if there's any questions on that sort of difference between unincorporated or incorporated just shout out drop anything in the chat if you want to i will tony yeah so am i right in saying that if you're unincorporated there are no legal requirements based placed on you is that correct that's correct except for you have to stay within the law unfortunately which limits us a little bit on what we might want to do but yes you can do what you want if you set up a group to i don't know attempt to close the footpath in pembrokeshire because you were sick of it that's fine you can do that and there's there's no legal requirements for you to do anything else than that and some groups trade really well in that setting and in that framework i'll be honest i'm part of an un unincorporated group that's been trading if you like for 70 years and still going strong and got money in the bank and got loads of executives and do all sorts of things and actually we're classed as a charity which is quite exciting so there's all sorts of funky things you can do but you're not governed by hmrc you're not governed by company's house you're not governed by the charity commission you just get on and do what you want to do which is sometimes quite exciting uh, Vicky, I can see your hand up. Sorry, oh. I'm struggling to see people and my screen, but I can't Sorry. see your hand. No, I just understood that if you were acting as a charity, you, you were um, then taken as a, I've got the term, uh, that you were, were actually bound to do certain things, uh, even if, it, especially for constitution, that's your management agreement and people can hold you to account for that. Did sort of. Know? I mean, but, you know, I don't want to quibble, but that's just what I understood. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, and, and you would hope if you set yourselves up as a charity, you can't do that clearly if you had to have any charitable aims and actually there's only a couple of really defined charitable aims I think there's only three off the top of my head one of them being education one of them being religion uh, and the other one I can't remember uh, it's sort of, of social is it sorry <laughs> it's relief of poverty and relief I think poverty. they've added sustainability in there at one point and there's a few <laughs> so there's a few yeah um, which is great and obviously yeah <laughs> you wouldn't want to try and call yourself a charity if you weren't doing any of those charitable aims and there is some Can I ask a question yeah go on make it valid um, it's um Lambeth grandma is established as a not-for-profit company mm -hmm. so it is incorporated but i'm wondering if there is an advantage in becoming unincorporated and how would you do that so uh, the only real advantage is is if you didn't want to be bothered with the paperwork that you get as a company so that's filing your course. annual returns yeah okay. there's a small cost to it yeah. you have to produce accounts you have to file your accounts properly otherwise you get fined and you have to do it in time it costs you 13 pound a year to declare your trustees or your directors mm. um, and it's easy to unincorporate you just wind the company up you need a bit of help to do that properly so you don't get caught out but basically you declare yourself closed you have to do that within within the terms of your articles of association. So it should define in your company rules, if you like, how you wind the company up. And as long as you follow those rules, that's but fine. But we could still continue. Yeah, you can still continue as an unincorporated group with a constitution defining what you want to do. You're able to set up a bank account even and, and move money around, take money in, spend money uh, and carry on to your objects. Um, you just don't have to do any of that paperwork if you don't want to sounds great yeah and, and you i'm can always, talking over with the others <laughs> yeah you can you can have a think about it you can drop us a line have a look at this presentation when we've gone through and see if there's anything else in there that that you think might be of interest for you and, and give us a call afterwards is there any more questions on that point okay i'll move on i'm not going to read through all of this slide because there's there's loads in there and you'll get it anyway but what we've got here it basically sets out what you can and can't do with the different types of legal forms so we've we've discussed unincorporated that's just a group of people either with or without a constitution doing what they want to do but just reminding ourselves that that unincorporated group could be a charity particularly if they're a small charity below five thousand pounds turnover a year it's moving up to ten thousand actually in some areas you can actually legally class yourself as a charity and go and shake a tin outside co-op um, and not get told off for it whereas you can't in other forms of charity but anyway moving on from that there are some key differences as to why you might choose one entity 
over another, I think, and often around CSAs. It's a question we get asked quite a lot around shares. Can I attract income fundraising through shares? And the answer is yes, but only yes if you have a few or one of the few specific legal forms. And that could be a company limited by guarantee, which is a shareholding company. It could be a community interest company, so a kick, but it has to be one that's registered for shares. And the only other ways you can do it is through a society. So either an IPS, a bona fide cooperative, or society for the benefit of the community, what we call a BENCOM. Those are the only legal entities where you can publicly raise share offers to attract money into your entity. And, and there's absolutely a desire in some cases to be able to do that. The risk in doing that is if your governance model, so your paper behind what legal form you have, says that you're going to allow shareholdings, many of the funders won't touch you with a barge pole because they, they see that in the traditional sense of it's a way of distributing company profits to shareholders, effectively avoiding lots of tax and things like that as well. And it's a, it's a way of rewarding members privately with finance. And often, even in the CSA model, you would actually want to reward your shareholders, possibly even with a bit of finance for doing it, because why else might they give you £20,000? Well, they might do it because you're offering them 3% interest return on their £20,000 and they're not going to get that in the bank. They might do it just through philanthropic social uh, methodology, if you like. So I just want to give you my money because I like what you're doing and I trust you with it. But I've still got access to it back. So please don't, don't waste it as such. Um, but if you do that, it is a problem for many of the funders to understand that. Um, and therefore, you have to really define it in your articles if you want to go for some types of funding. Um, what are the limits are there so if you have a a limited liability partnership is one i would avoid they are a real complicated nightmare to be honest and you just end up in reams and reams of legal paperwork and nobody really understands a partnership when you say a partnership in in our community terms we work together it doesn't really mean that in legal forms and there is a defined limited liability partnership legal entity and it's a bit of a nightmare to be honest it's normally where where two individuals come together to form a partnership to, to progress, let's say, a particular type of business or something. Um, we do have a few within the CSA setting, but not many. I would argue that the most, the most favourable ones we have are KICs, CICs. We have some considering CIOs, Charitable Incorporated Organisations. Uh, we certainly have a few societies um, and we have a few sole traders and we have a few private limited companies. Um, downsides of IPSs, Bencoms, cooperatives are there's much more complicated system to set them up. They cost a bit more money to set up and actually they're completely differently regulated. So you're regulated under the FCA now, Financial Conduct Authority, which basically is there to regulate banks, which is pretty hideous. And they also regulate IPSs. So they would end up regulating, let's say, Kaitan, Tom's not here, I can talk about Tom and Kaitan. If Tom went down the route of an IPS, he has to report to the FCA, which is the same as if he was Barclays Bank or HSBC or any of those high street banks. They all operate under the FCA. They deal with all insurance bodies and things like that. So actually, it's quite complicated. It's a bit specialist. Your bog standard company bookkeeper stroke accountant may struggle to do the filing right. The fines are bigger because they deal with fines for banks, not community groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's, there's some, some considerations that would have to be taken in there, um, certainly if I was recommending it to anyone. Things like CIOs, Charitable Incorporated Organisations, were meant to be the sort of, the very much more achievable charitable sector, if you like. Um, but actually there's such a backlog on them, it, it's taken them forever to get through the applications to become a CIO and they really are vetting them, which is interesting. They never used to. You just used to apply and said what you wanted to do and get through it. And, and, and that's just generally interesting. There's quite a lot in there. So I won't dwell on any of that. But if you've got questions, shout out, raise your hands up. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is move on to looking at ones that I think are more applicable to CSAs. Um, 
So if we talk around CSAs, they can be obviously community-led or farmer-led. A partnership or association is often between a small number of growers. That may also be referred to as a mutual in, in terms of the old fashioned cooperative models of, of mutuals coming together and doing, doing good stuff and farmers still operate under mutuals. Um, co-ops, workers, agricultural, consumer, community led food buying groups. So a co-op again is that just group that coming together, we want to work cooperatively together, we might be a workers cooperative, we might be an agricultural cooperative, we might be a buyers cooperative buying from sumer and coming together. Uh, we've talked about social enterprises. Social firms are slightly different. They're where they're set up to create labour opportunities specifically for disadvantaged people in their communities. Um, and to use that tag of social firm, you'd absolutely have to be doing that as your main focus. I'm going to move on from that one. Quick look. I was just, I picked out two out of that long list to delve into quickly around CSA. So community interest companies, sort of benefits, why you might consider it, why you might not. So you can get limited liability with it. It has a very simple set of company governing documents. You can get them offline. You can set up a kick for 36 quid, I think it is these days, or maybe even cheaper if you do it online. You can create a membership within a kick. So you can have opportunities for different types of members to join. So you can build your membership, your person asset base, if you like. They have compulsory asset blocks. So if you set up a kick, you have to define in your kick what you are going to do with your assets should you go bust, want to give up, want to move on. So in Val's term, if you close down a company, you just decide what you're doing with your company assets. If you like your money in the bank, you distribute it where you think you do. But with a kick, you have to define that when you set up and the kick regulator will look at that. And if you decide you're winding up your kick, he'll say, oh, what are you going to do with your assets? And often kicks are set up with a named entity they want to pass their assets onto. And that makes it really easy. Uh, and in fact, I was a benefit of one in in my days with Ian Cultivate. Um, a kick in McCantleth was winding up and it donated all of its assets, mowers, trimmers, pots, everything to Cultivate because it was defined in its articles. That's what would happen if it wound up. Um, you have to report to Companies House. And in addition, you have to do an annual report to the kick regulator. I doubt it's one person sitting there waiting for all these reports to come in, but somewhere you have to file a report that tells that group what you have done to support the community that you declared as your community of interest. Um, so a few pages, doesn't have to be war and peace, but you have to say we are working towards supporting our community of interest. Um, you can have shareholders if you set up as a shareholding one. And interestingly, it's one of the ones where you can have a minimum age of directors of 16 companies, it's 18 plus. Um, and you can actually now, which I do think is a little bit bizarre, be a single entity community interest company. I, you can be one person that sets up a kick. Um, that's fairly new as well. Any questions on kick? And I'm not advocating any of these, by the way. Tony. Yes, it's a, um, uh, it's a question really about membership i mean i think all of the kicks that i am aware of are membership organizations um and i had up until this minute thought that that was a, a legal requirement to have some kind of membership or or, or or structure that you're serving um but i think looking at this that's not strictly speaking the case no nope, not not anymore at all no nope. you can literally be one person that sets up a kick and define what you're going to do and go and do it on your own um, but as it says in there, that is discouraged. And you might come up with a bit of resistance from the kick regulator. And what often kicks will do is they'll define different types of membership within their kick. So they might have producer members, they might have consumer members, people buying, they might have grower. Um, yeah, I've said that one. Uh, they might have, what else might they have? They might just have a friends of group. So people that generally want to get a newsletter, but don't necessarily get actively involved in any of it and that's good for just disseminating information building support so if you ever need a fundraising entity and you've got you've got your members to go through directly and and them to help share the workload as well any other questions on kicks okay the the second one i picked not necessarily for any great reason was the ips route industrial provident society so when I think of this, I always think of the Black Widow and the lady in her cloak and galloping horses going across the 
sand and things like that. And actually, these are a really old form of, of legal entity, really set up around the Victorian industrial period, I suppose, when 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 jobs growth was was rising. Lots of individuals were making wealth out of their business, but there was a good groundswell of people saying, actually, hang on, this is all being done through poor workers. So it was it was set up in that that regard really though often they were set up as trust funds for workers widow pensiony type funds um and there's two main types a bona fide cooperative which is where your rules are pretty defined and you can't really change them they're set by the cooperative movement and every member has a vote an equal and just vote at an agm and that's the basic principle of it there are some other principles within the cooperative rules you support other cooperatives as one of your key rules um, you work mutually together, et cetera, et cetera, um, and they're, they're quite defined. Um, but they, you can be, <sighs> the, the define themselves within a range of organizational types of cooperatives is a bit, bit of a rubbish sentence I put in there, sorry. But you could be legally a private company limited by guarantee called a cooperative, as long as you've got certain cooperative principles in your governance but it doesn't give you that automatic one member one vote rule so are you legally a cooperative well yes you are you can call yourself a cooperative under certain conditions you can't just set up tony little co-op limited without having really good cooperative rules behind you the company's house might take a dim view of that and some of the names are protected but theoretically you could create a cooperative that is just a company but when you do it through the industrial providence society you basically go through this additional set of 200 year old rules and principles and it gets vetted by the fca as we've said um, very much normally geared more towards social aims much less understood by funders and other organizations than kicks and companies and cios so if you go to your local authority and if you went as a cooperative ips during coronavirus and asked for your support loans from your local authority they'd have said actually no because you don't exist on our company's database so you can't have it and that certainly happened to a few of our ips's and kicks that not kicks co-ops they couldn't claim the statutory government support because they literally don't exist on the company's registrar because that's where local authorities tend to look for stuff um, you can write in asset locks uh, they are a bit more complicated and a bit more expensive therefore then to register and if you get it wrong it's awkward to change it um, you can have shares, as we've said, which is a real bonus of them. You have to have a minimum of three members, so not a huge amount. Any quick questions on IPSs? And remembering an IPS could be a bona fide co-op. It could be a community benefit society. It could be a, a few other names as well. But in terms of growing, they tend to be Bencoms in the main. OK, that's it really for my presentation. I'm happy to go back to any specific points. We've got a set of references at the end for you to go and delve into any of those more, lots of really good resources, some put together by us, some some by Tavi Cymru, but then there was a whole host of work done a few years ago um, through the cooperatives movement around setting up good governance and some really good documents there to read. We, we can support groups with conversations and stuff. We don't really these days take on the responsibility of registering new entities, changing new entities, swapping from one to the other. There's quite a lot of work in there. And in Wales, we're, we're quite lucky to have the Social Business Wales group and co-ops Wales to help with that. And often they can do it for free. You might still have to pay the, the, the standard company setup fees, um, but they have much more expertise than, than we could dream of sort of retaining to help do that so we can refer people into there as well okay i'm going to stop sharing so that we can see each other